At that time, the government was having trouble getting young men to enlist. It was no longer just hippies complaining. Even the veterans from other wars wanted answers. It was getting really difficult for our government to sell this crazy war to the masses. Especially being we're supposedly the strongest nation on the planet. Yet every night on TV, we saw a bunch of third world Bush people kicking our butts. So some asshole in Washington came up with the brilliant idea for a lottery. I guess they figured everybody likes to gamble, it's the American way. The master plan was to randomly pick capsules that had birth dates in them out of a giant container. If your birth date was among the first 100 drawn, you were a goner. With the next 100 selected, you had a 50 to 50 chance. The rest would skate. Of course, conspiracy theories were coming out of the woodwork. I especially love the one I heard this radical hippie dude on TV come up with. He said that the government knew the exact number of males born on each date. Supposedly, they would make the capsules with those higher number of births in them wait less. That would bring them to the top when they put them in the container. His theory was scary, but then again, smoking too much pot made you paranoid. Well, you know what happens when everything is going smoothly. Someone always turns on the fan. This time it's Uncle Sam with the hottest game in town. Broadcasting live at 8 p.m. For the first time ever on national TV, win a free trip to Vietnam. I have seen some major events on TV from the first time Elvis appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Shit, they were scary times. I can remember those air raid drills in school, where we would duck under our desks, praying to God that there wouldn't be a nuclear war. Then there was the assassination of John F. Kennedy, followed by Jack Ruby shooting Lee Harvey Oswald. Then Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King getting it. But none of those events would have an impact on my life as much as this one. For me, this was the show of shows. A lot of my friends were trying to figure out a way to beat the draft. If they weren't in college, they tried enlisting in the reserves, but many others did too. So that didn't last long. Many started seeing a shrink. Having a drug addiction was very popular at that time. That's when the rehab business started to flourish. There I was stuck in the middle once again. Many of my Gentile friends who weren't all fucked up on drugs they were enlisting, while my Jewish friends were finding ways to beat the draft. There I was with no high school diploma, finally on track learning a new career. I'm making good money while trying my best to escape from my colorless world. And so far, my luck hadn't been that bad. So I took my chances with the lottery, and that night had finally arrived. In my neighborhood, people were having lottery parties. Bring your own beer, pretzels, and don't forget your nuts. I stayed home and got really religious that day. I know it sounds hard to believe, and if I hadn't seen it for myself, I wouldn't have believed it either. There it was on the TV, a big container filled with capsules. I was playing in a nationwide game, and for many of the losers, it was a death sentence. And they wonder why our generation did drugs. This bulldog-looking guy with a crew-cut hairdo and a dark suit slowly reached into the container when it stopped spinning and took out the first capsule. He opens it and takes out a small note with July 26th on it. He hands it to another guy, and he puts it on the board. He takes out the next capsule and so on. I never did any gambling or any kind of risk-taking back then, but I did know the feeling of the unknown. This was no different to me from the nights I waited for the old man to come home loaded. Or those times when I was lured into a fight and how the fear I felt in the beginning would turn to anger, followed by a rush of adrenaline flowing through my body, and suddenly I was invincible. That's pretty much how I felt not being picked by the 38th capsule. I was still alive. However, my hopes were soon shattered. On the 39th pick, they nailed me. I couldn't believe it. Two years in the military would put me in a hole one way or another. It had nothing to do with Vietnam. I just couldn't afford to lose that kind of time. It was the first week in August when from out of nowhere two FBI agents show up at my store. After showing me their ID, the one who's taking charge, Agent William Farrell, takes out two big manila envelopes from his briefcase. He opens one of them up and takes out photographs with some familiar faces on them. People like Joseph Big Joe Gamtucci, Lou, the Arm Gamtucci, Joey Stakes Gamtucci, Gino Shorty Boy Ferrante, Tony Numbers Bernardo, and Johnny, Detroit Johnny Delino. Agent Farrell asked me how I know these people. I told him from the Atlantic City casinos. He asked me what I was doing with them in the casinos. I told him gambling. That's it, he asked. I said, that's it. Then he opens up the other envelope and takes out more photographs. The first one he shows me is me and Joey Stakes getting into his Lincoln outside the Coliseum. 
then a few with me and Joey standing outside of his Lincoln at the Golden Mine self-parking garage. They're all not easy to make out, but in one of them it looks like he's given me packs of money, and I'm putting them in the pockets of his black leather blazer he gave me to wear. There's one of me with Joey and Rosie Love from Massages Are Us. The last one he shows me you see me and Joey mob hugging in the Cashmere nightclub. I asked him why he's showing me these photographs, and he asked me if I ever heard of the RICO Act. I've heard of it, I said, but what's it got to do with me? RICO is short for the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organization Act. In a nutshell, Richie, it allows us to charge many people for broad activities that we determine are part of an ongoing criminal enterprise. So, let's say someone is taking illegal money in small denominations into the casino and depositing it in the cashier cage in order to retrieve the money in larger denominations. That's a form of money laundering and that's illegal. If found guilty, one could do 10 to 20 years in prison and have to pay fines up to $500,000, or two times the value of the laundered funds. Listen, any money I got from those guys was in order for me to get a big game. I didn't ask them where their money came from, and they didn't ask where mine came from. We were partners. Richie, let me get this straight. You never changed up their small bills into $100 bills in the casino cashier's cage, and then left the casino without playing. Look, it's possible I could have done that, but that's because I couldn't get a head-up game at that casino. So I would take the money to another casino, in hope of getting a head-up game. That doesn't make sense, Richie. Of course it doesn't make sense to you, and that's because you like the New Jersey lawmakers who legalize this scam have no idea how casinos operate. You may be right about that, Richie, but we do know how organized crime operates, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today. Well, I guess we're at a stalemate because I'm not talking anymore until I talk to my attorney. Not a problem. Talk with your attorney, and when we need to talk more, we'll be in touch. He put the photographs back in his briefcase. Before shutting it, he takes out another envelope. He hands it to me and says, You can keep this one, and when we talk again you could educate us on how these guys ran the golden mines. I reached in the envelope and took out a photograph of Charlie Myers and Joseph DeVito. They left the store and I'm thinking the roosters finally came home to roost. Now what the fuck am I going to do?